Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Seth from EFF. Nice to see you here. Thank you all for coming. I know it's pretty early in the morning. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about disk encryption. I hope that what I have to say is well matched to people's interests. Uh, feel free to ask lots of questions. I hope we have time at the end for questions, too. OK, so disk encryption is a pretty important precaution. If you imagine yourself losing a device, for example, you left the device somewhere, or someone stole the device, or you have no idea where the device is, and you think about, oh, there are all these things on the device that are very, very important, and I have no idea who has the device. Now, you might well have a very good password on your Linux laptop. You might have a very unguessable password, a very long password, a very complicated password. But if you don't have disk encryption, someone can bypass that password really easily if they have the device. For example, they can boot the system into single user mode and now they have root on the system and they can just go look through all the directories. Or they can take the hard drive out and they can put the hard drive in another machine or connect the hard drive to a USB adapter and connect it to another computer and look through all the files on the laptop. So your password is irrelevant to preventing someone else who actually has your machine from looking through your files if you're not using disk encryption. And when people lose a device, they may feel very anxious and they may feel very disturbed and they start to think, oh, I had some really sensitive things there, I had some really important things there and I have no idea who is looking at them, what they're doing with them. Um, you know, some people who work in professions like healthcare or the legal industry may have a lot of really sensitive client data and it really stresses them out if they've lost devices, if they've lost disks that contain that data. Uh, and in fact, in some states, they're required to tell the client. Uh, they're required to tell people when there's been a potential loss or breach of personal data. And so it can also be very embarrassing uh, to have to contact people and say, you know, I'm sorry, I actually lost my laptop and it had all your client files on it. So disk encryption is a very powerful precaution against this situation, against the risks and harms that could result from losing a device. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing about disk encryption. So if you've lost a device and you say, oh, but the hard drive was encrypted, you have a lot more confidence that other people aren't going to be able to look through it. So I see disk encryption in this sense as very parallel to backups as a precaution that you might take um, to make sure that what happens with your data is what you want to happen. So computer security people often talk about several properties that you want to achieve in information assurance, and one of them is called availability. And that means that you want the people who are supposed to have the data to be able to actually get it and to be able to actually see it. And then there's a confidentiality property, which means you don't want other people to be able to get it. And I think, you know, one is sort of the flip side of the other in this context. And so we have backups to protect availability to make sure that the people you want to have the data have it. And then you have encryption to protect confidentiality to make sure that people you don't want to have the data don't have it. Um, so I think people, you know, most of us don't make backups as frequently or as regularly as we would like, but people understand that it's an important precaution. Uh, and I think in the same way people are coming to understand encryption as an important precaution. So we also have this concept of data at rest, data in motion. So data in motion is data that's being transmitted over a computer network. Uh, and we all do that all every day. And we have lots of encryption technologies to protect data in motion. For example, HTTPS, which I talked about a lot yesterday morning. So yesterday was my data in motion day, and today is my data at rest day. Uh, SSH, if you're logging into, say, a Linux server somewhere else. Uh, there are lots of others. You might be using OTR for instant messaging, uh, ZRTP for voice over IP phone calls, lots and lots of technologies to protect data in motion. Uh, and there's still, as I said yesterday, lots of work to be done to make sure that people are using those technologies to protect their communications. Then you have data at rest, like data on your laptop. That's data that's actually stored on a device. Uh, and you have different protection needs and different protection concerns there. And we have different tools for that, including file encryption, directory encryption, volume encryption. Uh, if you want to encrypt, for example, an individual file with a password, there's gpg-c, c for conventional as opposed to public key cryptography. Uh, and then the things I'm going to describe right now. So your main choices for encryption on a Linux laptop are DMcrypt, TrueCrypt, and EcryptFS, although there are several other possibilities. 
Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between these things and what they do differently and why people might choose one over another. Um, one fairly unfortunate message is that if you've already got a system that you're using and you're not using disk encryption, it's quite inconvenient to convert it to start using disk encryption after it's already up and running. Uh, typically, this is something that people want to do at install time when they install their system. And there are recipes that do a conversion. And you can go out to forums and people can say, well, if you have enough spare space, you can use DD and make a backup of your partition. And then you can make a new encrypted partition where your old partition was and restore the backup and stuff. Um, a lot of these things are fairly complicated and fairly risky. And I don't mean to um, suggest that there's no point or no benefit. But in a lot of modern distros, you actually have an option during the install process in the installer. Do you want to encrypt your disk? Do you want to encrypt your home directory? And typically, the do you want to encrypt your disk results in dmcrypt. Do you want to encrypt your home directory results in ecryptfs. Um, so that's my recommendation if you have the choice, that you think of this as a basic step when you're getting a new device, when you're setting up a new device. Um, I think it's likely to produce a lot of headaches to say, oh, I've got this laptop that I love that I use every day and I'm going to switch it over to activate disk encryption. Okay, so ecryptfs is per directory. Uh, Luke's and TrueCrypt are operating typically for people in a whole disk mode. So the difference is, do you take the entire disk or the entire partition and encrypt that? Or do you take individual files in a particular directory and encrypt those, uh, which is the ecryptfs model? So as I said, if you're in your installer and you get this choice, do you want to encrypt your disk, do you want to encrypt your directory, uh, that's what it's referring to. One of the really bad consequences to per directory encryption, like with ecryptfs, is that the other parts of your disk, the other parts of your system are not encrypted. So for example, you have your temporary directory slash temp. And if you're using ecryptfs, slash temp is not encrypted. So if you go into a text editor, if you go into a word processor, and you start working with a document, it may make a backup of that document in slash temp. And if you go into your slash temp, you may actually find a bunch of files that were left behind by programs that crashed or something uh, that are documents that you were working with. And those are not going to be encrypted. And so this is a particular risk to the non-whole disk style that you've got all this stuff outside of your home directory that's just not being encrypted and not being protected at all. Uh, there's also a performance comparison. Basically, ecryptfs is slower, especially if you have a lot of files in one directory. Uh, it's individually encrypting and decrypting not only the files themselves, but the metadata about the files, like the file name and the file modification time. And that means if you run ls in a directory with lots and lots of files that's encrypted with ecryptfs, it's going to take a long time because it has to go to each and every one and do a separate decryption operation just to find out what the name of that file was. Um, whereas in a whole disk encryption technology, you're going to be decrypting disk blocks and you're going to get an entire disk block at once when you do each decryption operation. And that disk block might contain the entire set of directory records for that directory. Um, another comparison is single user or multi user. So if you have a shared system that a lot of different people use, a per user directory encryption like ecryptfs can be much more convenient because it encrypts each user's home directory with their own password. Uh, and in that case, everyone just needs to know their own password to log in and everyone gets their own separate encryption protecting their files. In the whole disk case, you typically have a passphrase that you have to enter when you turn the system on. And that's separate from your user account password. That's your disk encryption password. Uh, and there's typically only one of those for the whole system. And so if you imagine having a laptop or a server or something that has many different users, if you wanted all of them to be able to power on the system, they would all have to know that shared passphrase. Um, in terms of compatibility with non-Linux systems, of these three, TrueCrypt is the only one that currently will give you compatibility with other systems in the sense that another system can read the encrypted volume. Um, 
Now, there's still the question of whether the file system that you put on TrueCrypt can be read by the other system. But uh, to my knowledge, there aren't DMCrypt and eCryptFS implementations for systems other than Linux or uh, systems that don't support Fuse in the case of eCryptFS. So if you imagine having, for example, removable disks that are going to be encrypted, uh, like an external backup hard drive, if you think that that's going to need to be written or read by something that's not Linux, then of these three, you'd probably want to use TrueCrypt for that. Um, and in fact, people very often do want to encrypt their backup disk. So a lot of people have an externally attachable USB disk. Uh, I have two of these at home. So I've got an enclosure and I've got a USB cable and I plug it in. And I originally created that with DMCrypt. So when I plug it in, I get a little pop-up in GNOME that says enter passphrase because it's trying to auto mount it and it's noticing that it's encrypted with DMCrypt and I have to enter my passphrase and then it mounts normally. Um, so that's pretty cool because it means that my hard disk sitting around my house isn't just readable to anyone who picks it up, uh, but only readable to someone who knows the passphrase. Now, TrueCrypt has a lot of very passionate advocates and one of the very unique features that people love to recommend about TrueCrypt is this hidden volume feature. Um, and basically the point of the hidden volume feature is that it's a technical measure in TrueCrypt that facilitates lying about what data is on your disk. Uh, so if someone asks you, you know, what data is on this disk, TrueCrypt has the concept of different passwords uh, and different levels of decryption that produce successive levels of access to more and more hidden data. Um, and a lot of people really enjoy this. And in the one context in which I thought about this in detail, which is the border crossing context, which I wrote a long white paper about, I felt that this is not very useful because in that particular context, there are very serious legal consequences to lying to the border agents. And so, and typically much worse consequences than just telling them I don't want to tell you the password. Um, so in that context, I felt that this feature, although technically very clever, was not actually very useful in the sense that it basically could only serve to get someone in worse trouble than they were already in. Um, I know that there are certainly people who feel that they've imagined situations, envisioned situations in which the hidden volume feature would be beneficial to them. Um, I haven't really thought of any such situations for myself, but it's certainly a feature that people like to talk about and like to advocate. Um, the idea that people can't know whether they've seen or discovered all of the encrypted data that's present on the disk. Okay, so another thing you can do, and this is actually like the external backup drive case that I was talking about, is that you can have a file on your hard drive that's a container file that contains its own file system that's encrypted that you can manually choose to mount sometimes. So for example, sometimes consultants will do this if they have different clients and they're doing different um, projects for different clients. They might have something like a TrueCrypt container for each client. And when they're working on that person's data, when they're working on that person's project, they mount that container and it comes up as a directory in their account. And then they can read and write those particular files. And when they're done, they close or unmount that container. And then there's just this encrypted file. Um, and so then they have this sense that they have this sort of separation, like these files are only decrypted when they're actually needed, these files are only decrypted when they're actually in use, and at other times they're not. And different kinds of projects or different kinds of activities are kept separate from one another. Um, and you have a similar situation if you have an external backup disk that's encrypted with one of these systems like TrueCrypt or uh, DMCrypt that it's only mounted when you connect it and when you enter that passphrase. Um, and I did want to point out that there's this risk of making unencrypted copies of the data outside of the TrueCrypt container or outside of the DMCrypt container, like in slash temp. If your slash temp isn't encrypted and you're opening up things in uh, LibreOffice or you're opening up things in Vim, and it's gone and written a temporary file, you may have actually written something unencrypted that you didn't expect. Okay, so a lot of people are using these online storage services and one frustrating thing about them to me is that in the default case, a lot of them 
use encryption to protect the data on the wire, to protect the data in motion between you and the service. But most of them don't use encryption to prevent the service operator from reading your files. For most of them, they just say, well, you have to trust the service operator not to do anything bad with their access to your data. And you know, the developer of Tarsnap said, well, backups are supposed to be uh, a way to protect yourself, not an additional source of risk. And so there are a small number of services that have client software that encrypts everything before uploading it with a password or with a key that's known only to you as the user, that's not known to the service operator. Um, and so that's one option. And then another option is to put an encrypted container on the network storage. And a lot of people have had a lot of success with this. So you can make something like a TrueCrypt container or a DMCrypt container and have that be the thing that you store with your cloud storage provider. Uh, whether that's Ubuntu One or Dropbox or any other storage service that someone uses. Um, and there are actually still a lot of other possibilities beyond these, but I just wanted to point to that. We have two questions here. Yeah. Can you open the container from the remote location without any leakage, or do you have to store everything and then upload the truth of the container? So a lot of people have had success um, <coughs> opening these things over a network. Um, in some cases, the details of that depend on which service you're using and which encryption software you're using. So you may want to check that the combination that you're planning to use has been reported to work properly by other people. But people have actually had success opening an encrypted container that while it was being stored on a remote storage service, uh, which I think is pretty nice because then people get a lot of the benefits of remote storage in terms of um, automated backups or potentially being able to access something from multiple places without having to have the storage provider uh, be in a position to read all of their files. Did you have a question too? Well, I'm, I want to tell you that uh, Google Compute Engine uh -huh. and Google Cloud Storage stores data encrypted at rest, and Compute Engine stores the data in flight between the virtual machine and the file store. So what you can do is you can upload the file to Compute Engine SSH around the world Google's cloud. So I don't think in that case the encryption is protecting you against Google. It does protect you against Google. I'd like to learn more about how that's implemented. Okay. I haven't heard that. Um, I mean, class. Cool. That's great if Google is prepared to do that. Google does So I want to talk a little bit about passphrases because passphrases are what we normally use to protect all of this encrypted data. Uh, one really fundamental point in terms of not increasing your own availability risk is that if you lose your passphrase, you're not going to be able to access your data. Uh, and that's a change from the situation that people may be used to. Like if you forget the password for your account on your Linux laptop, you can go into single user mode and change it. Uh, and I bet many of you have done that or have helped other people do that, where someone's forgotten a Unix password of some kind and you went in and changed it. If you've got disk encryption, you're not going to be able to just bypass the disk encryption just by having root, because it's actually scrambled with this secret information. And the computer itself doesn't know how to read it in the absence of that secret information. Um, so a lot of systems will suggest creating a recovery key and writing it down on paper somewhere. Uh, and depending on whether you're afraid of someone finding that piece of paper, this can be a really good precaution. Um, now, in EcryptFS, the default behavior is that your user account password will unlock your home directory. So your login password and your cryptographic password in EcryptFS, by default, are the same. Uh, that's different from the other systems that I've mentioned. In the other systems that I've mentioned, you have a separate encryption passphrase which you need to enter when you turn the system on in order to unlock the entire hard drive. And that's distinct from your user account password. Yep. So in the case of going in as uh, a single user and changing the password, did then they become out of sync? That's right. Yeah, if you change, right. the, if you change the password in another way, 
in eCryptFS, then they'll be different. And the uh, encryption password will, will still be what it was before. OK, so I wanted to talk a little bit about choosing a strong passphrase. Um, so three pretty good ideas for this are using a complete sentence that has never been published anywhere, uh, using a line from a song or poem with idiosyncratic modifications, meaning that you want to change it in an unpredictable way, even if slightly. Uh, and one that I particularly like and have been recommending to people, the diceware method. OK, so I want to show people a cartoon, which many of you may have seen. Uh, it's this XKCD cartoon here. Uh, and this XKCD cartoon has some mathematical calculations. Uh, if you search for correct horse battery staple, you'll find this cartoon. Uh, OK, so what's the idea of this cartoon? This is a kind of password that people were traditionally told by system administrators they should be choosing. It has numbers and it has punctuation. And it's pretty hard to remember. Hard to remember, right? Was it trombone, no troubadour, and one of the O's was a zero? And the But Randall Monroe does the math and he says, actually, if you were trying to crack this by machine, there aren't that many possibilities. It's not that strong. If you were trying to guess it as a human being off the top of your head, well, you wouldn't be able to guess it. But if you're a machine just trying and trying and trying and trying millions of possibilities per second, um, you would actually get this very quickly. Just because it's a relatively short word and trying millions per second, you would eventually be able to try all possibilities for all strings of this length. Um, so this is diceware style. Diceware style involves randomly choosing words and stringing them together. And the randomly choosing words part is really important because a lot of people read this cartoon and they just went and thought of four words. And if you just think of four words, they're not going to be random in this sense. Um, there's a much smaller set of possibilities of words that you would just choose off the top of your head compared to words that you would choose by a random process that's not under your control. Because human beings are not very good at generating random stuff off the top of our heads. And people have demonstrated this in various ways. Um, a pretty nice demonstration of this fact is if you have human beings play rock, paper, scissors against computers, there are actually computer programs that can really clobber the human beings. <laughs> because human beings have patterns in how we play rock, paper, scissors, even if we try not to. And there are actually computer programs that can find and recognize those patterns in our choice of rock, paper, and scissors and exploit them against us and beat us. Um, obviously not every time, but on average, they can do better than we can because we're not choosing these things at random and there are these systematic patterns in how we choose. Okay, so here, Randall Monroe chooses four words at random. And he chose correct horse battery staple. And he does the math and this password is much stronger than that one. Even though this one looks more human oriented. And he then gives a way that you could remember this and there's a little staple that's been stapled into a battery. And the horse is saying, that's a battery staple. And someone uh, out of frame is saying, correct. Uh, and he says, well, you've already memorized it. And that was certainly my experience when I read this cartoon and saw this picture of someone telling the horse correct when the horse identified the staple in the battery. I have, in fact, ever since remembered correct horse battery staple. So if Randall Monroe were actually using this, I could log into all of his accounts and things. Um, Anyway, I think the really nice property of this is that you can potentially actually remember these things by making up mnemonics for them. Um, so the idea is that you're choosing some number of words at random from a dictionary, and you can do the calculation. The number of possibilities is the number of words to the power of the number, the number of words in the dictionary to the power of the number of words that you choose. Um, measured in bits, it's the number of words that you choose times the base two logarithm of the size of the dictionary. So if you wanted to do a comparison, Mathematically of password strengths, this is the 
formula for doing it. Um, the cool thing, whether or not you want to do that calculation, it's pretty human memorable, but pretty strong. Um, so I mean, we can, well, we don't, So here's a dictionary. Uh, now one problem with this is that you want Okay, so these are the ones that don't have any uppercase or special characters. Um, So that's 64,000 words in that dictionary that don't have uppercase or special characters. Um, right. Now some of these words are a little bit obscure. So people might want to use a dictionary of more common words. Um, but Uh, anyway, you could use this to get some of these passwords. Um, now you might notice that a lot of these are a little bit more obscure than correct horse battery staple. Uh, but they're actually stronger because we're choosing them from a larger dictionary. Um, and you, you can do the calculation and think about how many words you would think you would need and uh, <coughs> A lot of people would suggest smaller dictionary, more common words. Um, so if you ended up with malpractice, dog trotting, regressive, sucked, I have a feeling that people would be able to come up with a mnemonic for that or a story. Um, I don't know. Ohm's boiler disciplinarian's captivation. I have to say that a lot of these uh, are a little bit harder to remember than correct horse battery staple. Permanence, nooning, continent, predispose. All right, yeah? Is the advantage of this over a sentence that's never been published uh, just people's pattern? The same thing you were talking about with rock, paper, scissors, that people will unintentionally pick patterns or something? I think that's right. It's a little bit challenging to try to empirically quantify how strong a sentence that's never been published is as a passphrase. We need some kind of model about how do people choose sentences. Um, yeah, I should probably be doing this with a smaller dictionary. <laughs> even, if it, even if I end up needing five words, um, but I did this in another talk, and I asked people to actually think of a story to help them remember one of these. What's that? Uh, this was 64,000. Yeah. So for the um, entropy calculation fans in the audience, we get 16 bits out of each word, um, which is a lot. So each of these is about 64 bits of entropy, which is a lot more than the ones that uh, we have in the cartoon, actually. And probably a lot more than any of your, you know, if you use, uh, what is this? Dash S. Uh, if you've got people who are trying to get you to use passwords like these, I actually think that these uh, ones made out of four words are going to be stronger than these, even though it might not feel like it at first. Yeah. You were going a little bit too fast for me. What, what program did you use to generate this list? Uh, I just created this program in Python. 
No, no, no. Oh, the, it looks like it was PWGen. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, PWGen. So PWGen um, is a program to generate random passwords. Uh, and it has lots of options. Um, and you can choose how long they should be and so on. Um, but I actually don't really like PWGen, at least for things that a human being is meant to remember. Because it really chooses these things that have no human sort of point of contact or point of reference to help you remember them. So I actually would not really use PWGen, except for a case where I'm going to write it down or where I'm going to put it into a password safe application. And I do recommend using a password safe application. And this is a program like KeepPassX. So I chose a really strong passphrase for that in a kind of Diceware-like style. But I only have to remember that one to unlock my password safe. Um, and then I actually have hundreds of different things in the password safe. And when I want to log into an account, I unlock the password safe. Um, and the one that I'm using is KeepPassX, uh, which is a free and open source one that's available, probably packaged in your distribution. Um, it's pretty nice. OK. Excuse me, so then you just cut and paste the password then? Yeah, that's right. So there's a, there's a copy and paste. So, so I can paste it into a web browser. So that'll hopefully, if there's a key logger, you won't be exposed as much for the passphrase. Although the key logger would get my master passphrase, passphrase for the uh, password safe. Right. Um, the copy and paste makes it comparatively easy to put it into a web browser. So you won't have to type out this thing. I open up the password safe. I go to the particular account. Um, it even has a shortcut to bookmark the URL of the account. So I can just press one key combination, and it makes my web browser go to the login page. And then I do copy and paste, and it pastes my password. Um, so I really feel like that's a security precaution that a lot of people can benefit from, because a lot of the attacks that we see today are someone cracking some really crummy security on some obscure e-commerce website. And then they find all these usernames and passwords that were stored totally unprotected on the server of that system. And they go and try all of those on Facebook and Gmail and Twitter and bank accounts with the same username and password to see how many of them will work. And typically, an enormous number of them work every time. Um, and so very often, this is how people's webmail, for example, gets compromised that they've used the same password for their webmail as for some other um, account, and then that account was compromised through no fault of the end users. And then the attacker said, I'm going to try that over here. Yep. To make it even easier, there are some sites that very helpfully email you your username and your password that you just entered uh -huh. in clear. Right. Um, if a site is able to email you your password, that's a bad sign because it means that they're not hashing it. Um, and I can talk about that more later on. But uh, just to try to finish this off, um, I wanted to mention encryp encryption limitations. Um, if someone actually wanted to get your data and they knew that you were using disk encryption, uh, there are some possible ways that they could do that. The most important one is malware on your computer, breaking into your computer, compromising your computer's operating system. Um, so whenever we use encryption to protect data on, that's being processed on computers, we assume that the computers that are intended to process the data are secure and are uncompromised, which is not always the case. Um, and a very high fraction of Windows machines are compromised in some way um, more often by deception, by persuading the end user to install malicious software, <coughs> pretending that it's something else, um, but sometimes by exploiting vulnerabilities where there is essentially nothing that the user could have done because their computer was taken over because of a programming flaw in an application that they used or in the operating system itself. Um, and although these things are less prevalent in the Linux world, perhaps because less malware has been targeted against Linux users, um, they still certainly exist and the vulnerabilities certainly exist. And so if someone is able to take over your computer, then your use of encryption is not going to conceal your data from them because they're actually running software on your computer, browsing through your stuff. 
Um, there are also a couple of things that an expert could do if they really wanted to try to bypass your particular disk encryption on your particular device. Um, one idea is called the evil maid attack, and that's when someone secretly gets access to your device while it's not running, and they modify the bootloader, they modify the software on your computer, so that when it boots and it asks you for your encryption password, it's actually recording that or leaking it somewhere because you've got a modified bootloader and the bootloaders come up and said, please enter your disk encryption passphrase. And that's actually the malicious software that's recording that somewhere. Um, there's also the cold boot attack and I was involved in the published paper about that a while ago and it was a lot of fun. And there the idea is that when you reboot a machine, the contents of the RAM are not actually erased. So people were all taught uh, when you turn off a computer, when you reboot a computer, the contents of the RAM are erased, but that's not actually true um, if you try it. Uh, there's a certain probability that any given bit in the memory will decay and flip to the other state, but that probability is not certainty. It depends on the time. And if you can keep it under half a second, the probability is actually very low. Uh, also, if you reduce the temperature of the computer, the probability is much lower. Um, and so, anyway, we demonstrated that if you had a machine with, that was screen locked but powered on, so the disk encryption passphrase has been entered, and the disk encryption keys are somewhere in memory, it's possible to reboot that machine, and if you can make it boot a custom operating system, the custom operating system can save the contents of memory somewhere, and we can actually go in and find the decryption keys in memory. Um, and that was a really fun research project. It's a little bit esoteric, although people have demonstrated that they can do it in the real world. Um, and so, you know, the scenario that people hope for is that if they have their machine screen locked, uh, then if the disk is encrypted, someone won't be able to use the computer because it's screen locked, and someone won't be able to reboot the computer and read the stuff because that would destroy the decryption keys, but it doesn't necessarily destroy the decryption keys. Uh, and there are a lot of variants of that. Uh, and there are also countermeasures that people have talked about about that. And then password cracking. If you have a password that's potentially guessable, someone can write software that tries lots of passwords really fast. Uh, a lot of people are interested in legal aspects in terms of if they got into a uh, situation with law enforcement, could law enforcement agents or could someone else, uh, or if they got into a court case where they got sued, could someone require them to reveal the decryption password? Do they use the legal system to compel this? Um, and the basic answer in the criminal context under the Fifth Amendment is that it's complicated and unsettled. Uh, <laughs> and my colleague Marsha Hoffman is a great expert on this and has worked on some of the cases, but there are court decisions that are somewhat contradictory or have taken slightly different angles on this. Uh, as a basic matter, it's only possible that you could have a Fifth Amendment right to avoid disclosing your encryption password in a criminal matter where you are or might be a target of the investigation or of a prosecution. Um, because the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination only applies to preventing you from incriminating yourself. Um, and then there's this question of whether revealing a password is testimonial. Uh, and different courts have viewed this differently. Uh, and you can talk to Marsha Hoffman if you want to know the details or talk to your own attorney. Uh, it's an interesting and still somewhat unsettled question of under what circumstances it could be considered testimonial to have to reveal that. Uh, a lot of people are also interested in when they're crossing a national border because the border agents might want to look at their devices and might want to look through them. And we wrote a whole white paper about this that I wrote together with Marsha Hoffman. Uh, which is available on the EFF website, and it talks a bit about disk encryption. Um, I wanted to just show... I'm using uh, DMCrypt here, and I just wanted to show that... Oops. Mm. SDA, I think it's SDA 5. 
Oops. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is very low level information, but uh, there's this command line tool if you're using uh, dmcrypt called crypt setup that lets you manually change passphrases, view information, uh, mount and unmount things, and also erase encrypted volumes, destroying the key material. Uh, there's also, so that's crypt setup. Um, there's also a program called Palimpsest. Palimpsest is a graphical disk manager under GNOME. Uh, Palimpsest also understands dmcrypt stuff. So in this case, I have my hard disk here. Um, so this is a problem in terms of the resolution of the screen because we can't actually see what it's saying here. Um, this says 160 gigabyte encrypted volume. Um, well, if we had adequate screen resolution, you could see that down below, there would actually be some icons that let you do things related to the disk encryption, including lock and unlock and change passphrase. Can you scroll down on the uh, right margin? I don't, oh yeah. Hmm? Uh, not far enough. I'm, that's as far as I can scroll on here. Um, well, oh, okay, right. Um, so this would make a lot more sense if you could see the whole screen. But Nautilus is a graphical disk manager. It understands this encryption. It understands that this is an encrypted volume that contains, that acts as a container for the data on the disk. Uh, and we can use the Nautilus Disk Manager to change the passphrase if we need to, um, to delete or modify the encrypted volume and to lock or unlock it. Uh, and the same would be true if I plugged in a USB disk that had a dmcrypt encrypted volume. Yep. So if you're not sharing it, would you you'd recommend whole disk encryption? Yeah, I think that the whole disk encryption provides you a lot better security properties overall. Um, uh, this program here is called Palimpsest, um, which is a term, um, it's a term for a document uh, that was once a manuscript that was then erased, and then another manuscript was written over the erased document, and such a document is called a Palimpsest, but this is a GNOME program that's named after that. It's not that it necessarily does that to your hard drive. Um, but people encounter this because paper used to be very expensive. And paper used to be so expensive that people would actually manually erase an entire document uh, in a very laborious way, just in order to get paper that they could use to write another document on. Um, and a lot of the time, historians and scholars have found the original document that was overwritten to be more interesting than the new document. So they've had to look really, really closely with microscopes and various interesting techniques to try to see what was written on it before that was subsequently erased. Um, and new microscope techniques have been very exciting for people because in some cases they have manuscripts of things that were thought to be lost and it's like, oh, well, this person wrote this contract for buying a cow or whatever, but actually it's a manuscript of this lost thing and if we look at it with the right kind of microscope, we can read it. Um, but the GNOME developers just chose to make their graphical disk manager called this. And actually in a lot of distributions you probably have an icon for this and it's probably called like disk manager or something. Um, I know Ubuntu has really been playing down all of the idiosyncratic names of all of the GNOME programs. So a lot of GNOME programs have kind of funny names that are kind of a joke. And the developer just decided to name their application some funny thing that's a reference to something. Uh, and I think the Ubuntu developers have said, you know, people aren't going to get the joke. We should just call it disk utility. Um, so I find that kind of unfortunate because I think a lot of the jokes are funny. And I <laughs> remember the names of a lot of the applications. Um, but you may actually find that your palimpsest is called something like disk utility uh, if you're getting to it through the GNOME menus. Um, and, you know, the integration is pretty good. So you can use this tool to format, for example, an external disk 
and to put a dmcrypt password on it. Uh, and then whenever you plug it in, you're going to be prompted with a little pop-up. I probably should have brought a USB stick with the dmcrypt file system on it so that I could demonstrate how you get prompted for the password whenever you plug the USB stick in. Um, but I like that a lot. You know, I wish that my doctor's office and other people were taking precautions like that. I don't really know if they are. They may just be writing my medical records on unencrypted USB sticks and periodically losing them somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's been, it's been a big problem in general that people, even in professions like the medical profession, aren't using disk encryption to protect people's sensitive information. And so we just get scandal after scandal after scandal. You know, NASA lost a bunch of hard drives with sensitive personnel information that weren't encrypted. Um, a lot of banks and financial institutions have lost hard drives with personal information that weren't encrypted. And it's very sad because it seems like if they had had IT people who had just taken the time to say, you got to take these precautions, it's going to take a little bit of time to set it up. But then when you lose the thing, we're not going to be in the New York Times as the organization that lost a million students' uh, academic records or whatever. Um, I think that would be great. So if some of you are in a position to get organizations to use disk encryption when they're processing their own data or other people's data, I think it's a nice thing that you could do for privacy. Um, and it does take some practice to make sure that people are in the habit of using it. Uh, and it does take some thought to make sure that you're not going to lose the passphrases. That the only person who knows it isn't going to forget it or isn't going to leave the organization. So that's a cost and that's a, a burden that has to be met, but um, I think there's a lot of benefit to it. Uh, I think people are starting to come in for the next talk. Mm -hmm. So I think I should stop here. Thanks very much.